uh, advancements in the machine learning and as well as how we can have used the Kubernetes native building blocks to build high performance uh, machine learning accelerations. Um, so for those of you which I haven't got a chance to meet, my name is Huang Ming Chen. I work for Red Hat. And this is uh, Yuanzhou, he works for Intel. So we, um, you know, as you see, we come from different backgrounds and different uh, the companies, but the goal is the same. We can use technologies to help people, especially those who are using uh, Kubernetes to do machine learning. Um, so the agenda of this talk is that we're going to go through some of the big challenge issues in machine learning. And if you are using Kubeflow or anything else, um, there's shared con uh, concerns that how uh, some of the bottlenecks exist today that we, can, we have no uh, resolutions yet as how Kubernetes can help you in these areas. And then we are going through different examples how this uh, framework can be used in both deep learning as well as data analytics. Um, so, um, for those who have used the machine learning and uh, has been got deeply involved, so the acceleration in the machine learning has been uh, growing rapidly. So, in hardware fronts, we have the hardware accelerations in the GPU and the CPU size, as well as the TPU and FPGA. In the software stack, and you can tune your algorithms to such extent that, you, for example, you can change your um, pre-process your data sets so you can have uh, speed ups like 20% or 30%. If you can uh, guess your, for example, the image uh, cropped in the right way, you can get the uh, reasonable uh, accelerations. And you can also use some of the latest uh, developments in the in memory stacks, like for example, Apache Spark or NVIDIA Rapids. These are all the great frameworks can give you a good accelerations. But they haven't solved one more issues yet. Let's take a big, uh, take a step back, looking at what has happened in the past 10 years. As we see, the, the CPU and you know, in terms of computes, uh, the computes has grown uh, exponentially uh, over the past 10 years, and I haven't had the data for 2017. Um, so as you see, the CPU is almost doubles um, uh, the performance, and when you talk about GPU, the, uh, the, progress, uh, the growth is even higher. Um, so the end point is we are computes is no longer, or just becoming no longer the bottleneck for when you do the machine learning. And if you are coming to 2018 and beyond, the um, picture in the chip industry is getting even more interesting because the competition-driven uh, technology advancements have never seen an end. You have seen uh, companies from like AMD, the Epic uh, um, CPUs that will have generational improvements like four times. And uh, the process nodes going to seven nanometers or 10 nanometers, depends on which company you're talking about. And the micro architecture improvements, you are seeing a bump in the IPCs. All these are good things in CPU. And you are seeing the GPU side, uh, NVIDIA releases new architectures, AMD also coming up with the MI60. So all these good things have uh, bump up the performance and uh, driving down the cost. Yet, if you are looking, taking another look at the machine learning, uh, if, especially when you run a workload, uh, the pictures become kind of uh, different. I'm just taking a, a small sample of the public data sets and how much time you need to download the data sets and how much time you just train the model. So if you are looking at the magnitudes of each of the data sets, uh, they are pro pretty much on par with each other, uh, so which means you spend a big chunk of your time just downloading the data sets and not running your GPUs or expensive GPUs or CPUs, and which leave them underutilized. And even though this is just a public data set, uh, it's the story is the same, especially when you are uh, hosting your data, for example, on S3, and you run your compute somewhere else, on-premise, on different data centers, or just, you know, if you have a heterogeneous data set running on hosted on different clouds, then it's going to be a problem for you. So the goal of this project, as you see, is going to address the, uh, the last mile issue. Uh, so we are trying to accelerate how data sets can be downloaded, uh, fed into the, uh, your machine learning pipeline, and uh, accelerate the overall performance. So the solutions can be anywhere, um, in my opinion, uh, in, this, uh, in this spaces. Either you build a customized file system, uh, which takes years to succeed, and by the time you have a file system, maybe the constraints you had 
before no longer exist, or you can uh, just cache your, you know, the data in the computer nodes, <coughs> as everybody's doing. You run your machine learning in your laptop, you run your, you have the GPUs in your data center. But the trouble is, once you come to the Kubernetes, um, unless you have a perfect affinity policies, the data sets may not reside on the same computer node that your part is running. So another is, actually, another is actually the third approach, somewhere in between. So we are not attempting to build a proprietary or different file system. We're trying to use whatever we have existing in you know, Kubernetes, the building blocks using the basic primitives in Kubernetes and to address the latency issues um, and scaling issues. Uh, for those who have not uh, seen Neza before, Neza is a Chinese mythology figure um, equivalent to Peter Pan in Western literature. So Neza is fast, you know, just like Peter Pan, and Neza never grow old. The idea is once you have your data in the cache, you never spend more time downloading the data. And with that, I hand over to Yuan. Okay, so I'm going to introduce uh, more details for this project. First is the uh, project goals. Uh, it's quite simple and straightforward. First, we want to improve the uh, data download speed by uh, bypassing the network latency, and also we try to put more uh, data closer to, to the compute node so that we can have a faster I.O. speed. The second one is uh, we want to build a Kubernetes native uh, project, which means it's very simple. There's no other dependencies. The, the core ideas we used is uh, host alias and also uh, webhook. I will uh, introduce those uh, uh, in later slides. The third one is uh, we want to make this transparent to end users. This means uh, your existing applications uh, don't have to change anything. It can run tra uh, transparently and can benefit from this project. Currently, we, uh, we still have some issue when handling HTTPS traffic, but for other protocols, uh, it's already working. Okay, so here's a general uh, diagram for deep learning training. Basically, uh, you just download the uh, uh, source file and then you do some uh, ETL, and then do some pre-training, get some checkpoints, and then you just try to adjust the weight or BIOS, some param parameters to tune the uh, uh, training. And then after several iterations, you get a well-trained model that can be applied to your uh, real application. Uh, so as Wyming mentioned, uh, people are trying to fix the uh, compute bound latency but there's also actual, there's also actual latency on, in, the, uh, in the up layer, the network and the IO layer. So this project is, is going to uh, try to fix that latency. Okay, so here's our uh, general architecture for, for our project. Uh, we actually only added uh, the middle layer uh, in the middle here. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, there's a caching port uh, which can do uh, caching to a local device. Um, you, may, you may need to expose a faster disk, maybe like SSD or even decent NVMe SSDs to those uh, caching ports. And also there's an a injector which can do a host alias for, uh, for your application ports. I will introduce the detailed uh, steps for a detailed workflow for uh, this project in later slides. So with this simple uh, architecture, uh, all of those data will be fetched from a local port. That's, that, that means you can have a very high IO performance and also availability will be uh, much higher. Okay, here are some uh, deployment models we have designed. The first one is a centralized uh, model. Uh, it means uh, you have to start a caching port first, uh, in, which port, in which you, you may need to expose a SSD device as the caching device. And also you need to create a config map, uh, which can, do, uh, can map those uh, 
data source hosts to, uh, to the service IP of the caching, caching port. And then uh, by, uh, by specifying some uh, labels for the application port, then all of those reads uh, from those application ports will be redirected to our caching port. Thus, it will be uh, much faster than fetching from a public network. Here's a, a centralized model. And we also have a, another deployment model called Sidecar, uh, which means uh, your application port, uh, your caching port will be started along with your application port. Uh, so your application can uh, fetch the data from a local uh, container network, which is even, even more faster than your internal network. Here we listed the uh, uh, comparisons for different deployments. Uh, if there's no caching, um, then your performance will be limited to, uh, to your external network performance. Um, also, your uh, availability will also be limited by the uh, network availability. Uh, if, you, if you use a centralized uh, deployment, then the performance will be limited by your internal uh, network, usually maybe a 10 giga network. But if you deploy with a sidecar model, then it will be, uh, the data will be fetched from a local, local container network. Usually it's a loop device, then it's, it's going to be faster. Okay, here's some uh, very details for the uh, deployment. Um, the first one is, uh, actually there's a full instruction uh, on our GitHub repo. And uh, I, I'm just trying to uh, brief the steps here. The first, is, uh, first one is we need to know the labels the application will use. For example, usually for a Kubeflow job, it will be labeled as uh, KISONET. And we, we just use, we use this label as the uh, uh, signature. And then you need to create a config map. Uh, there are three three important uh, components here. The first one is uh, uh, first one is a label. Uh, it just, uh, just we use a KSNet here as an example. And the second one is the uh, caching port IP, which which is actually can you can fetch this IP from a, a shell script. It's quite easy. And last part is the upstream servers for for those uh, source data. Here are some um, examples for Minix and and also uh, CIFAR and also Coco dataset. Uh, usually, it's a uh, uh, download speed will be like uh, maybe several megas per second. But if you uh, okay, so I'm going to introduce the uh, the real application job. Here's an example job uh, which we just did a simple double get. Uh, it just try to download the data source from an uh, external website. And with, with our caching, um, you, so on the first download, you can see the performance is like maybe several mega per second. But if you're for the second and following downloads, the performance will be much, much faster. OK, this is a very, uh, very simple example here. Okay, for next, I'm going to introduce a, a more uh, complicated or interesting use case. So we have seen uh, big data are also, analytics workloads are also moving to the cloud. The, the key technology here is uh, they use uh, HCFS. Uh, it's called Hadoop Compatible File System, uh, which can translate those uh, Hadoop API to um, uh, object store API, like S3 or uh, Google Cloud object. So instead of using uh, traditional HDFS setup, people are trying to move their uh, big data workloads to the cloud to use uh, S3 as their data store or Google Cloud as their data store. The benefit of this, uh, of such setup is uh, quite obvious. You can actually scale in your compute cluster and your storage cluster independently. If you, if you need more compute resource, then you can add your Compute nodes, and if you 
for your storage nodes, it can also be acting as a common data lake. Uh, the other departments may also put data in, into this storage cluster. And also, um, since Spark 2.3, uh, it is able to run on Kubernetes natively. So we also tried to see our project, uh, if our project can benefit uh, Spark on Kubernetes. So here I listed several uh, uh, important uh, object store connectors for Hadoop world. Uh, among these, uh, the most popular one is S3A. Um, uh, because uh, there are many uh, private implementation for S3, like Ceph or Swift or Minio, people can uh, set up their own S3 storage and do some um, um, work with, with that part. So S3A is actually uh, uh, picked here. And usually, uh, if, you're, if you're using a public S3 as a storage, then the data reading is very, very slow. Your, your public networking is uh, the bottleneck. Even if you use a private S3, then you still have to fetch the data from the remote cluster and then do some computing work in your computer node, computer cluster. So there's always a latency uh, between the computer cluster and the storage uh, cluster. So here, here's some uh, example uh, for uh, uh, Spark over Kubernetes with S3 caching. As you can see, uh, we, we actually use, a, a we have a compute cluster in, in our player. Uh, there are several uh, compute nodes and some compute nodes are, uh, are deployed with this caching. And for, for the first, um, oh, I'm sorry, for, for the uh, storage layer, we use, uh, you, you may use a public S3 or even a private S3 uh, as the uh, storage cluster. But for both solutions, there's a storage networking um, isolation between with your compute, compute nodes. So there's a latency when you fetch, fetch the data at the first time. But if you have a, a caching on your uh, caching port running on your Kubernetes cluster, then for the following reads will be uh, fetched from, from the local caching port. I actually have done some um, uh, basic uh, uh, tests with uh, modified TBCDS. Uh, it's a common, uh, it's a quite popular uh, query workload. And we found for, for those uh, IO intensive queries, like the queries will read many, many uh, data, uh, the performance improvement can be like 30% uh, or even 40% 40, 40 improvement. So that's a very big improvement. Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, so uh, you may usually want to expose an SSD device um, SATA SSD device or even a decent NVMe device for the caching so that you can have a, a very good uh, local disk, local reading speed. But uh, can, we, can we do better? Uh, yes, we can. So here's uh, some um, uh, a new uh, device from Intel. It's called uh, Optum uh, Data Center Persistent Memory. Uh, it's exactly the same form, fa form factor of uh, DDR memory, but uh, it is built with native persistence. Um, also, the speed, uh, the speed for, for, for this device uh, is going to be faster than uh, SSD device, uh, a bit lower than uh, DRAM device. One more interesting uh, thing here is, uh, uh, you can see the uh, size for this persistent memory. Uh, it's going to be like, uh, it can have five, 512 giga per DIMM. That means uh, if you think, think about your servers today, most of the setup may be like uh, 32 gigas per DIMM. That's a very uh, luxury, a luxury setup right now. But with this DIMM, um, you can build a one, tera, one terabyte memory cluster with single, or with two DIMMs. That's a very, very attractive point. So here's some uh, 
uh, performance um, comparison uh, with uh, normal SSD device. So in the, uh, in the right side is uh, a VME SSD. Uh, as you can see from the, uh, uh, from the picture, for 4K read in NVMe SSD, it's going to take like uh, 19 uh, microseconds. But for, uh, oh, sorry. So in the middle, there's a bar for Optum SSD. Optum SSD is, uh, um, they use the same media, but different form factor. Optum SSD is using a PCIe factor. It's not a DIMM DIM device. So as you can see from the picture, in Optum SSD, uh, the, latency, uh, the performance is going to improve a lot. Uh, the latency is like 15, 15 microseconds, but you still suffer from um, uh, the driver the file system uh, latency. Um, and in, in, the right, in the right bar, that's a, a performance for, uh, for the new, new DIMM device. Uh, without those file systems, with, without those driver latency, then the, the performance can be improved like uh, 10, nearly 10 uh, microseconds. That's, that's very, very, very fast, actually. OK, so uh, uh, just a uh, uh, heads up. So, uh, Intel Kubernetes team are developing CSI plugins for this team, and they, um, the, the, uh, I think they have a, a general working code right now. Uh, the idea is to expose a node local team to uh, Kubernetes as a block device. Uh, this is a, a starting point. In the future, they will, they will provide more features like uh, different from fact, different memories. So they have a, a repo, public repo uh, here. And if you want to know more uh, details, just go to Intel booth. Uh, there, there, uh, there are some uh, technical guys there. OK. So just a, a summary. Um, so Nerja is a Kubernetes native big data accelerator project that can uh, improve your uh, uh, input data performance. Um, we use host LS and also webhook, which is uh, transparent for uh, applications, so you don't have to change any code uh, in your application. This can be applied to uh, uh, machine learning, deep learning workloads, oh, sorry, as well as uh, big data analytic um, based on object storage. Uh, in our uh, basic tests, we found the performance improvement can be like 30% uh, or 40% of, depends on the uh, input data size. As for the next steps, we're, we're going to uh, check on the uh, HTTPS support as well as the uh, sidecar container solution. So, I mean, do you have any? Yeah, I think that's it. So I'll open to questions. Um, the question is, uh, can this could be applied to container? I think that the, because the container images, oftentimes they're hosted in the S3 or object store. Yes, so the idea is yes. So we can definitely accelerate that. Uh, so what you need to do, because this is a uh, generic configuration, in the config map we have for the injection, you just need to point to the endpoints of your um, registry. Um, but the downside is we haven't figured out, I mean, actually, we haven't uh, completely solved the HTTPS issues yet. So because dot org, yeah. So the um, Mike preliminary idea is to inject the certificates. Um, you know, this could work. You self sign the certificates. You self sign the certificates, and then you inject the certificates as a secret volume. This could work. Um, but you know, 
that's just my technology point of view. There's a compliance auditing. Yes. yes, so that's going to be a different thing. So can this be helping? Yes, this can help. To what extent we need to validate? Yes. Um, do you have a SQL connector, like uh, just for our data analytics? Data warehouse. Data warehouse. So if you are doing uh, just the downloading, and uh, um, I think this, we are only doing the, uh, the truth is, as long as there's a way we can catch the data, yes, we can definitely do it. Whether that's ATT protocol or some other protocol, we have to investigate. But the truth is, the host alias injection can work for any host. As long as the host uh, name is already in the pod, then the network working routes can be changed. So I mean, the next step, you know, more or less, we have to take a look is as how Envoy is doing this uh, proxy, right? So we are doing this independence of Envoy, um, Envoy and Istio, because we don't think that is going to be used in the crib flow. But there are some certain methodologies in Envoy and Istio we can borrow and just to use this project. Yes. All right, so the, for those two questions, so the sort of based on uh, Saika, I think it's Saika is going to be a promising one because um, even you have the centralized cache or you can, even you can replicate the cache there's still a chance of failures, right? If once your uh, redirection fails or the part is not respond, responding, then you are in trouble. And you are also subject to your VPC network uh, performance. The sidecar is interesting because it's always available. If, if it is not available on that node, that means the application part is not running as well. So you can safely discard that node. So I believe that's going to be the ultimate goal for the projects. And there's also some other uh, things we can explore. As you know, the Kubernetes 1.13 supports the snapshots volume, right? So if you have your volumes um, that have the raw data cached, you can snapshot a clone that's volume and distribute them on each of the sidecar volume. So the idea is that you can have the same source of data. You just need to take a quick clone or snapshots, and then you can use that volume on each of the sidecar. So you essentially have the data available on each of the sidecar and you don't need to download all the data again. So that's going to be an even higher scalable solution. Yeah, you can still do the caching, uh, but chances are the data, you can, once you do the snapshots, the data is already there, so you don't need to download it again. Yeah. But that's going to be a very interesting exploration. Yes. Yes. All right. So it was if the cache is already changed. I think that's a, I have another talk coming for uh, Knative. Basically, we detect something changes. If something changes, I mean, that's a long-term story. But the idea is that if anything changes, we can invalidate that cache. And probably, we can just invalidate that single object. We don't throw away the whole cache. So is it, there's a possible solutions. We need to take some explanations. I think uh, uh, if you are doing, the, if the proxy is working the right way, it should be able to detect upstream change as well. Uh, but if not, we can go to the service way. We can detect object change and then validate the cache. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I can probably, sir. Maybe we are not running into the same issue. So in my opinion, so um, uh, the idea of uh, using a cache 
uh, instead of downloading, directed from public repo, uh, data sets repo, is uh, the time is always consistent, right? You don't have to worry about when the part will start. I mean, if you, are, if you are talking about the trading part, the data is, once the data is available, you can guarantee that data, the, the trading part will start immediately. So there should be no latency uh, in between. So if that's a different issue, maybe we can chat offline. All right, restarts, we can happily go for lunch and enjoy your meal. <laughs>